Hi, um, it's Janet Fitch. It is noon on Wednesday, and that means it is Writing Wednesday, uh, where I answer your questions, I hope I can, and uh, talk about the writing life, uh, writing, story, sentence, senses, uh, whatever comes up. So um, I hope you will uh, ask your questions in the comments section. And uh, I have some questions today um, uh, through the uh, WebUverse. You can always write to me at janetfitchwrites.com. And um, uh, I'll be answering your questions on Writing Wednesday. I'm always happy to get the questions. Uh, I want to know what you're concerned with. Uh, this last weekend, I taught an intensive um, weekend course at the <coughs> at the community of writers um the old squaw valley crowd and now it's community of writers and it's virtual um but it was three days of exploring senses and writing um seeing how the senses work as a bridge between the inner world of the imagination and memory and the outer world of phenomena. So learning to uh, observe uh, how to capture sense impressions um, and then how do you get from the impression, your perception, to the page. Uh, so there's kind of two two levels to writing from the senses. Hi Jill! <clears throat> and it was so good. I was really surprised how well Zoom worked. Um, uh, it didn't have to just be a lecture. It, it's almost like this, except that you can actually see the people and they can physically ask the questions uh, in real time. Everybody really dug in on the exercises and had a super time. So uh, I have been asked to do something else and I think my next class uh, for them will be um, the art of the sentence and looking at how sentences create style, how you create style in language and um, kind of the art, the art of writing, the real art, uh, the, you know, the big peaks. Uh, so that's sort of the advanced course. Um, you know, first we have to learn how to write and we have to, you know, develop character, understand what characters are doing. We have to learn how to write in scenes, how to progress a story, how to um, uh, do dialogue, all these things. And then language itself, the poetics of the sentence, uh, is sort of finishing touches. Um, but for people who are having trouble getting published, <laughs> you know, and you've got the characters and you've got the story and it's pretty good. It's pretty exciting, but still can't crack that wall. That was my problem. Uh, and I had to figure out that there was a whole aspect of writing that I was not familiar with as a history major, uh, a whole aspect of writing that I was unfamiliar with and had to learn, uh, how to create sentences that were worth reading. Um, reading fiction is, it's a two level endeavor. Um, uh, one is that you, the more exciting, most exciting books are books that work on two levels. Um, the reader both wants to hurry ahead to find out what happens. You want them to be super engaged, super excited about, you know, seeing what's next. But you also want to be giving them such beautiful writing that they also want to linger and read that sentence again because it was so good. And that exquisite tension between wanting to stay where you are and read that sentence again and wanting to move on and find out what happens. That's the best part of writing for me. Uh, and I think for most people, um, it is, uh, that's, the, that's the sweet spot. So I had the urgency, I had the story, I had all that uh, character. 
but I did not have language and I didn't know it. I didn't even know it. I was probably submitting short stories for eight years before I got a rejection that said, well, what's unique about your sentences? And it's like, my sentences? Oh, and then I, it took me a while to figure out what that meant. <laughs> Cause I'm, you know, that's a big one. And it, you know, I wasn't trained that way. I mean, when I would read, I would notice really good writing uh, but I was more caught up with the story. I was like the person who sat in the third row at the movie theater, and I just wanted to be in the movie. Uh, and it, ne you know, it never occurred to me, even as good a reader as I was, it never occurred to me to move to the back of the theater, watch the film, and understand, pull it apart, try to figure out what's, how the effects are being made. And I started reading differently. I started l reading my stuff out loud. It was extremely important. So I am uh, now I, so I'll probably be teaching that class in December or January. So I'll announce it here. I'll announce it, you know, on social media and uh, the community of writers will be announcing it. I love teaching with them because they handle all the tech stuff because <laughs> If I had to do that as well as teach, uh, it wouldn't be as much fun for me and it wouldn't be as much fun for the participants um, to have those interruptions. So it works seamlessly. It was so wonderful. Uh, that week, that intense weekend, hopefully that intense weekend sinks in, you know, like you have a, when you go away to a writing retreat and, uh, or conference and it, it's, when you set aside a piece of time like that and to work intensely, it, it stays with you longer. That's my theory anyway. So I, I like that weekend intensive. It worked well. Well, we already have a question from Terry. Hi, Terry. Um, I'm writing my first mystery beginning with Spanish speaking woman conversing with friends and she doesn't know how to voice it with or without using native tongue. Okay. Um, I would use a little bit of the Spanish if your Spanish is good. I would do a little bit of Spanish and then do the rest in English. Maybe putting a sprinkling of, of um, words in. You can also take a look at Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano uh, set in Mexico in 19... 39 and see how that's done. There'll be phrases of, um, you know, Spanish phrases. There'll be, you can put, you know, if there's a lot of Spanish, you probably don't want to do that to an English, with an English speaking readership, but you can give the flavor of the Spanish by having it opening maybe a little bit in Spanish, having some phrases, using the cadence of Spanish and maybe even the word order uh, makes a very interesting. So look at a good translation of Spanish, uh, of a Spanish uh, language novel. Like um, look at Bolaño, uh, Roberto Bolaño's The Savage Detectives. So these are friends who are speaking Spanish to each other in an English translation and see how that was handled. Uh, I did that in, in, I mean, the Revolution of Marina M and Chimes of Lost Cathedral is a Russian speaker in Russian speaking to other Russian speakers. And um, I used fra Russian phrases, but mostly I heard her, how she would speak. Um, and... Uh, did my best to translate that into English. Um, so yeah, do do take a look at that. Hi, Linda. Um, Janet. Hi, Ruthie. Ruthie was in that uh, sense class. Diagramming sentences. I will be doing diagramming sentences, but I don't do it well. I, I really do it like with a chainsaw because 
you don't as a as a writer you don't need to know exactly how to do it you need to know how to look at a beautiful stylist sentences and have some idea of what's going on how did they build those sentences how do they hold up because and that feeds into our topic for today which was how, how much is too much so that's good um, this is interesting Linda says uh, that the, it sounds good I either mimic the voice of what I'm currently reading or my writing voice sounds like my thinking voice uh, and that's no good um, I think your writing voice will always sound like your thinking voice um, and I don't have a problem with these overtones of what you're reading I think they go into the flavor of the book um, that the reader won't really be able to identify that chapter oh that chapter you know the, the artist was reading you know Cormac McCarthy I can hear Cormac McCarthy there but you can probably you can recognize that was you were under the spell of Cormac McCarthy here but I don't worry about it I mean there are people who have what they call the agony of influence they don't want to, oh influenced by others oh but I'm of the opinion that there's room for that it's like wine tastes like the soil that it was growing in uh, if that chapter was steeped a little bit in the garlic of what you were reading the reader will just know that that chapter had a certain flavor to it they, they won't criticize you as they're saying oh that was pure Cormac McCarthy you know it's never pure Cormac McCarthy you're taking on a little bit of the flavoring of that and I find when I teach style I often will take a paragraph of um, somebody who's a very strong stylist I mean some people just have a real strong flavor uh, to their writing you can you can identify that person without any kind of indication of who it is and then we look into how they do how they build that how that works their vocabulary of course makes a difference but sometimes the sentence structure demands a certain kind of vocabulary which is interesting and then I'll have you use that their syntax with your own content and write something write a paragraph in the style of one of those masters just so you can see you know what what would it be like to write in that high formal style of say the ninth, the you know 19th or early 20th century how would that what are the markers of that style what would you use it for um, I have certain people who just their imprint on sound is so strong the way they put a sentence together is so strong and interesting and you'll find that the writers that you're attracted to might flavor your work more right that's but that's not artificial you're attracted to them that is a natural reaching out of your own spirit to their resonating with their prose and if you find yourself your work flavored by that syntax by that spirit by that sound it won't be at odds with what you do it's your your own spirit is reaching out for that so that does reflect you um, so I don't have a problem with that uh, huh. so Natalie was in that class too oh, I'm so glad you were there um, so anyway our, our questions today have to do with uh, a question that was asked in the sense class I'm taking them through all these how do you describe a sense impression how do you describe the light that's hitting my face right now how do you describe me in terms of the light 
uh, it's usually pretty scary the older you are. It's like, <laughs> I don't like to model for the class. <laughs> because you see everything. You see the way the light is falling from this side. And, you know, that's the way artists will tell you that you can't, you don't see objects. You see light falling on objects. So it teaches you to f follow the light. So you see the light comes at an angle here, it hits my forehead, leaves this somewhat in shadow, you know, where it is on the nose, how it shapes, the light shapes my face, it shapes my nose, it shapes, it gives me these gouges. So that's true. Uh, forms, you know, it coils on the ball of the cheek, whatever you want to call it, these, you know, um, anyway, the, the question had been then, when you're describing a complex tabletop, all the reflective objects and highlights, and you know, I'm just teaching you how to see the way a painter sees, the way an artist sees. Um, it's good to use photographs um, because the, a good photographer has already pre-selected for you. Your eye doesn't have to look through a welter of stuff to, to um, uh, figure out where the highlights are and shadows and so forth. I mean, the photographer has already cleaned all that out for you so you can actually see the shapes. Uh, painters, you know, Latour and, you know, uh, uh, Monet, very good with all that but the question was how do you uh one of the uh writers in the uh class was saying how much is too much people always say i'm putting in too many details so that's what i wanted to talk about today the too many details problem now i'm as a maximalist myself i mean i really want you to see hear smell and be there in my books. I don't want you just to be looking at them. I want you to be physically experiencing them. That's using the senses. So I come up against this all the time. People who tend to be a, you know, once you start working in the senses, once you start really trying to describe the physical world, then this will be a, a you know, an issue of how do I know when it's too much? Um, what to leave out. Um, you know, obviously, I'd rather you put everything in and then weed. You know, it's like plant all the seeds in the, in the packet and then pull out the stuff when it starts to grow and just like, oh, that's too crowded. Rather than trying to edit yourself as, you know, it's like trying to have something come through and trying to edit at the same time. It's like people getting caught in the doorway, you know, everybody's trying to push through at the same time. And people, it's, you know, it's much better just let it come out, like turning the taps on, turn the taps on, let it come out, and then take what you've got. And then you have to make some aesthetic decisions. It's like flower arranging. It's like, you know, think of a flower arranging. Think of having a whole sink full of flowers to make your arrangement with. And what is going to give you the most interesting aesthetic effect? You might not want to use every plant you've got in there and just cram it into a thing and then it's just, it looks like a bucket full of every kind of flower and no arrangement whatsoever. You want the reader to feel that you're in control, that you're giving them an experience. Um, in this case, and this is the case often for poets who start to write fiction, is you have to think of the experience of the reader, of pacing and that urgency. You know, we're talking about the tension between wanting to read on and find out what happens and linger for the beautiful sentence, the beautiful description. The first thing is you don't have to do a description all in one chunk. You mix it up 
little here, little here, little here, always like th in the blender. So you're not getting a big indigestible chunk of description. And then you go into the live scenes. It's like, then people think, oh, I'll just skip over the descriptions. You know, you want them nicely kneaded in like a well-marbled stick. Um, and uh, we don't eat, eat that anymore, but we can read it. <laughs> it has less calories. It won't give you a heart attack. Um, then it's also, think about that. I always think of my reader as a fish. Sorry, but this is part of it. You think of your re reader as a fish. And you get your fish on the line, right? And you keep some, t you gotta keep some tension on the line. And that's the, the line is that desire to, to run ahead and read more. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? And then you can stall them a little bit with some description that they'll give you that. You're not gonna lose them immediately if you give them a little description as they want to know what's going to happen. It's like, you know, you let them run a little bit and then you really you know, keep the play. The, um, the, uh, but you don't want to lose the fish. You know, once your reader starts looking at description and then when you, the, the minute that you hear blah, blah, blah in their minds, you've, you've lost your fish. You know, have you ever given a lecture to a small child or not so small child and have them go blah, 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 blah. You can see it in their eyes when they stop listening. Uh, and you want to be very, very careful when you do uh, descriptive, descriptive writing that you're not, that teenagers' eyes are not going to roll back in their head <laughs> and have them in their minds going blah, blah, blah. Uh, or think, oh, this is, this is, I can skip this. This is, nothing's happening. So first of all, you have to trust the reader. Uh, my old writing teacher, Kate Braverman, used to say, um, think of the five smartest people you know and write to them. You'll write to the top of your ability and you don't have to explain the joke. You don't have to explain things. If they don't get it, they don't get it. You know, they'll move on. Um, but also, think of your reader that how much your pacing of your scene, uh, how much description and where you put it, um, affects the pacing of your work. You always want that. In fiction, you always want them to know what happens next, you know, and be moving towards, visibly moving towards the next thing. So your description places them. It gives them the visuals. It gives them the sounds, the smells. It puts them into your the body of your character because your character is seeing all this stuff. But don't give them things they don't need to know about, you know? Um, if you stop and explain about the town, how the town was fat in the middle of a live action hand-to-hand -hand combat scene, and you stop and tell them about, you know, Tamerlane and his battle there, you know, think about how much your reader wants to be, you know, in an action scene your character would not be stopping to give you Tamerlane's history. They may be, at, you know, when they're making their dinner over the fire, might be thinking, you know, how we fought all day and how Tamerlane's soldiers would be exhausted right there and what they ate and, or something like that. But so your description has to be keyed to where you are in the story. Is it a languorous moment or is it an action moment? And if you have too many languorous moments, which is created by too much detail that doesn't have a purpose in the scene, um, you're going to lose your reader. They're going to swim off because there isn't any tension on the line. Um, 
I always have to think about it myself because I'm a throw it all in person. I like all the detail. I want, I want all of it. And then I have to go, mm, okay, there's three day details too much here. You know, I don't need to know this. Is this slowing things down in a live scene? And you get a feel for it. The, the further, uh, the more you write, the more critique you get. Uh, you're often your writer's group. If you have a writer's group, um, they'll save your life um, because they'll say, this is, this is, you know, it's slow in here. You know, get on with, just get on with it. Uh, and the thing is, you both want to get on with it and have the interesting details. You know, I don't ever care what color somebody's hair is, you know. I don't care what color their eyes are. I don't care about, you know, too much detail about their, what they're wearing. Um, one or two things that set us up with the character spin. Like, if I want to do, I'm doing, say I'm doing a party scene. At the beginning of, of uh, uh, the revolution of Marina M, there was a party scene. And the kids are up in the... Uh, in the nursery uh, reading their New Year's fortunes the Russian way, dropping wax in the water and then reading the wax um, so you have to do it at midnight on, on uh, New Year's Eve and I want to give a sense of what people are wearing uh, girls getting ready for the, I mean there's a ball downstairs and girls getting ready for the ball uh, you, you know, you want to know what they're wearing but it should be characteristic. You know, my character's a redhead and she's wearing a rust, rust and green iridescent silk, pretty fancy and her hair is up. She, it's her family, she's pretty wealthy. Uh, so in a short description, I'm giving also description of the times, I'm giving description of uh, Petersburg before the war, um, what fashion looked like in those days, how they thought and how she thought of herself. And then she describes her two friends and what they're wearing. The important thing is that one, one of the friends is wearing, looks very pretty, but she's wearing a sky blue dress that her mother made. So we get a different socioeconomic kick off of that. And then the third one is wearing this rusty black silk. She's aristocracy, but totally broke and she's also a Bolshevik and she's cut her, chopped her hair off. Uh, so you get character from the descriptions. It's always through somebody's eyes and it always tells you something about those characters, something about the place. It's never neutral. Neutral description can just be cut. There's no point in it. Um, it needs to link on to something. If I, one of the, um, examples of of sensual writing is Lawrence Durrell anybody who knows me knows I'm like crazy about Lawrence Durrell and it's from Justine and it describes you know fairly long paragraph um, a certain time of day in Alexandria Egypt be between the wars and it's late afternoon and the city like lifts its head like an old turtle you know, it's like, okay, I'm picturing this. We're hearing the clip-clop of horses that are taking um, men in flower pots, you know, the, the hat, traditional uh, red hats, um, down to the water, across the cobblestones, down to the waterfront where the cafes are. And suddenly I'm in the map, and I'm the map of Alexandria is opening as he's describing these things. So it's very purposeful, and it puts you in a, it creates a city using these sensual elements. It is brilliant. It is uh, uh, right at the, be fairly close to the beginning of Justine, and well worth it's, it's six o'clock is how the passage begins. Um, so it's a, your description is always purposeful and uh, you just want enough. It's like, how much perfume should I wear? Well, you want enough perfume to smell it, but not enough to make people ill. Um, 
you know, how much food should be on the plate. Have you ever noticed that when you go to a buffet and all you can eat buffet and you put all that on your plate, it's kind of disgusting to look at that plate. It doesn't, it doesn't look appetizing, you know. I, I'd rather see less food on the plate. Um, it becomes more interesting, but I don't want to see like three little mushrooms either. Uh, I want to have a feeling of a, you know, of a luxurious repast. Uh, so don't put too much on the plate that, you know, the reader's just going to go, I don't want to know this much. You always want them leaning forward. You want always them. Uh, I was, I took a plane ride uh, once uh, and I talked to the guy sitting next to me. Big mistake. But I'm friendly, you know. Talked to this guy next to me and, and it turned out he was uh, right in the middle of a divorce. And, you know, being nosy, being a writer, you know, I'm always like, oh, tell me more. Well, you want to know, for about 30 seconds, I wanted to know more. And then I wanted to just know, know more, you know, headphones on, oh, pretending to be asleep. You, know? <laughs> you don't want your reader to have too much so that the reader doesn't want to know anymore. You always want the reader leaning forward. You want the reader to know, like giving them not quite enough so that they're still interested. They still want to know more. They're curious. Now, you know, um, there's this line in Under the Volcano, another one of my favorite books, um, where um, <clears throat> the main character mentions Oaxaca as being like something bad happened in Oaxaca. And then each time, every you know, eight, 10 pages, maybe Oaxaca will come up again. And again, and, and then we remember, you know, something bad happened, you know, what's gonna happen? You know, we got the fish, you know? And then on like page 40, it was like, Oaxaca meant divorce, just a line. It's like, oh, the divorce. And then a couple of pages later, there's a little bit more about what happened to Oaxaca, you know, and he feeds it out to you. He doesn't give it to you all at once on the first page, you know. So he's very conscious of pacing and how to pace the detail being revealed. I'm not a big, big on withholding. Purposeful withholding kind of pisses me off. Uh, because I feel like the the writer is like holding their little precious, my precious, you know. Like you're not going to learn about this, but I'm going to keep referring to it. Uh, and it's usually very heavy-handed, that kind of foreshadowing. Um, whereas just that little dropping of Oaxaca meant divorce is, um, you know, that's masterful storytelling you know, the pacing at which you reveal things. But you never want that feeling that you're you're teasing the reader and it's like, you know, you know, in a couple of weeks she would know, you know, what it meant. <laughs> it's kind of heavy handed. Watch that. I, I'm not hot. Um, the other thing is that one of my favorite movies is the is um, uh, uh, Dia, um, uh, Diana Vreeland uh, movie called The Eye Has to Travel editor, a fashion magazine editor um, if you don't know of her and it's a delight she's a super eccentric person and delightful and outspoken had opinions about everything and the the um, she used to tell <laughs> her photographers uh, and people who work there, don't be boring. Don't be boring. You know, don't give people what they think they're going to get. Think about how, what to give them that they're not expecting. That's going to, you know, really surprise them. And when you talk about description, make sure it's not boring. And I mean, not just the content, but the way you've written it. Uh, you always want active description, even in talking about landscape or objects on a tabletop. 
um, there there needs to be action. Either the protagonist is interact or someone is interacting with that landscape or object. Um, something is moving. Something is interacting with stationary items. Um, so there can always, even light, I mean, because light interacts, like I was just saying, light, that's what one of the things we did in the sense class is how light creates the world, how artists see. Uh, they see light falling on objects, not objects. And light can, there's a lot of activity with light. You know, light falls, it washes, it brushes, it you know, caresses, it dribbles, it, it, you know, burnishes, it blanches, it can do all kinds of stuff. Um, and those are active verbs. So the light can, you can have something happening even when there's no one in a room. Something can be happening. Um, like, instead of saying there was an esplanade in Alexandria, Egypt. I'm taking, going back to that example. There was, there were cafes down uh, at the waterfront um, that came to life in the, at six o'clock. No, it's like the clip-clop of horses. He's doing the sound. The clip-clop of horses uh, pulling carriages full of businessmen and their flowered pots to the cafes on the waterfront. So we're following a motion to reveal those, those uh, cafes. It's not just there were, you know, it's not like noun. It's always look at the verbs, you know, is something happening? And that will be very useful in her uh, in asking yourself whether you need all the description because if you can't find activity as a way to reveal it, some encounter, um, a, the girl ran in out of the rain. Uh, you know, heavy hanks of her hair dripping onto the stone floor. Then it's not her hair was wet. It's not there were puddles on the floor, but you're having the activity, the verb. It, it will be extremely helpful uh, to deal with active descriptions and help you not to be boring. Not be boring. <laughs> Okay, Susan has a question. Uh, hi, Susan. I was so glad to meet you at the at the uh, uh, in the sense class. Okay, hi. Uh, my draft memoir uses military terms. Uh, it adds to the authenticity. Uh, shows how my life was influenced, uh, but not using tech terms or jargon. Yeah. Okay, jargon is cliches like level playing field, boots on the ground, you know, on the ground. It's like, duh, yeah, you are on the ground. Let, let's get out of that, you know. But if you're trying to give a flavor to um, the experience of military life, you don't go to the store, right? You go to the, there's a name for the store. Uh, it's not PDX, but it's a name like that, right? <laughs> little technical difficulty there. <laughs> um, you know, you're going to go to the PX. Uh, so you use the terms that make sense. Um, but if they're too obscure... You can have a tiny footnote at the bottom, that at the bottom of the page, if if you worry that they're not going to understand if it's very complex. But generally, just let it sit there. Um, don't overdo it. So it's like when you, um, you know, I don't know your writing, so I don't know how heavy 
or light you are in in this kind of stuff but when you use uh, a uh, system of speech that you know of thought like in the military the everything has name um, there is a line between what I call licking the wallpaper you know if you ever seen a period film where the, they're just so excited that they got those cars and they got the, the clothing mm -hmm. right and stuff. And then it's just like they're licking the wallpaper instead of getting on with the story. Um, so avoid licking the wallpaper. There, there shouldn't be too much of this um, going on, but you do go to the, the, P, the PX and you do go to different places that have certain names and certain officers have certain titles. Uh, you know, look at Catch-22 and see how he does it. You know, if you have too much, it's just, it's a barrier for the reader. You want enough that it's a flavor and not like a whole plate full of cumin. Uh, but this is definitely a uh, you can see it in, and it's a, it's a matter of taste. It, it, you know, people who write sci-fi, um, there are people who are super into the science of it. And they just have to know that they're cutting down on audience as the more of the science they want to include, the more technical they want to get. Uh, they're exponentially losing um, readers. They're losing general readers, uh, but probably being embraced by a select group of sci-fi aficionados who like the, the science aspect the best. That, that might be why they read it. So all kinds of readers, but generally you want to um, give the flavor of an experience, but not make it a barrier. Uh, I had this going on in... in um, Marina M and in Chimes, uh, where there's a lot of history, a lot of uh, uh, civil, especially Russian Civil War and what was going on in the Civil War, what was going on politically uh, in uh, uh, with the revolution, the different parties and stuff. And you have somebody, if you have a general reader on tap who isn't really good at that, and you let them read it, they'll let you know when it's just like I don't want to know all the, I can't follow this. So then you prune. It's like if you've ever grown people who grow flowers for um, for cut flowers uh, for bloom, they'll take they'll be like a chrysanthemum on a or a rose uh, stem with several buds on it, uh, and they will nip off the secondary buds so that the big one is really gets very big. And so think about where where you can prune the side buds, you know, what you really need to make your effect. Um, okay, somebody wasn't into Justine. I'm, I'm making, you know, everybody has their favorites um, and different aspects of the book that do it, that are... A, a lesson for you. How do you how do you stay on topic in your writing without going off on a tangent? Um, if you have a character who is, it, it depends on what you mean by a tangent. If I have um, a character who is having an interaction with another character. And something they say reminds them of something that happened in the past. I might flash back for a few sentences, maybe even a paragraph, and then come back into the scene. And then the scene goes on. And maybe I'll go back to that memory and come back. But always come back. You're in a scene. Everything you write is in a time and a place live scene and something has to happen in that scene that changes the character that changes the story that that they can't go back to the way it was before so that's your scene and then these other thoughts will be little 
uh, flashes and then you come back into the scene and then another little flash and then you come back in the scene. So always remembering where you are will make a big difference and always returning to your central scene. Um, so I don't have any problem with the, the little little asides, little things that people think of that, that bear on the scene. Not just, God, I wonder, I mean, that's kind of funny, but you know, it, it's not helpful to be making love and then remembering the shoes you saw in the store. There's no, unless there's some connection between the current scene and the flashback or the aside. Um, these side pieces are fine with, you know, what you're calling tangents. I don't like the word tangent because it's pejorative. But these asides or memories that come up, um, maybe imaginative little trips that are sprung, uh, they should always have something to do with the scene in question. They should have, they should be a, a, another uh, angle of the prism to give us insight into what's going on in this current scene, not just completely random train of thought. All righty. Uh, the passage, I felt that way while reading the third edition of Frankenstein. The passages that Shelley edited just went on and on. Uh, we also live in a different, uh, What's that got to do with the story? Yeah, well, they were, you know, he was a poet. I don't know about Shelley. Um, um, but she was, you know, the form was really being invented at the time. Um, I think that uh, the modern readers are a little more restive. I'm reading something by Yunichiro Tanizaki right now called The Makioka Sisters. Oh, it's a wonderful book. But both the people in my family could not read it. Uh, it just was too slow. Uh, it's an intricate, delicate family, multi-character -fam multi family novel moves very slowly. Now, I'm fascinated by it, but the modern taste does move. I want something to move uh, visibly. Like, where is this going? Um, so, you... The modern taste is a little bit faster uh, than the 19th century taste. So that's just something that you have to think, are you writing a 19th century novel? Or are you writing a contemporary novel? But everybody wants to be in the story. Everybody wants that detail. Everybody wants to physically be in the story. Uh, it affects you more deeply when you see what the character sees, smell what they smell, um, and interact with the world. Don't just describe static things always the interaction. Um, oh, thanks, Zunaid. Good to see you. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I can... Yeah, but we all have the PX, the commissary. Exactly. Use those terms just figuring that, that you wouldn't think twice about that. Um, and uh, just trying to um, always keep something, you know, the sense that you're moving along. The static description is going to kill you. Uh, if the asides reference something else in the story or stay in the scene, so that is like a character thinking, uh, Kimberly says. If the asides reference something else in the story, how's that? Or if they stay in the scene. Um, well, the character is physically in the scene. In the psychological, in the world of the character's mind, they can go anywhere in the world. Um, but this is a question of somebody to whom asides come up, they just spring unbidden, and what, which ones to put in, and which ones 
are not going to help you. They should always be about that story, that, that scene. They can reference something else that you've already seen. Sure, but come back, come back to the scene because what's happening in that scene is what's happening. Um, is there anything else that I can talk about with these issues of what you put in? How do you stay on topic without going on? Oh, I did that one without going off on a tangent. Tangents are good. I like, I like tangents. I like, um, uh, I don't think of them as tangents. I think of them as unfolding the story. You know, it's, it opens. Uh, I don't like, um, to read a story where nobody has a past. Nobody ever thinks about anything that happened, right? Like, except they have no, they don't think about anything except what they're doing at that moment. They have no past. They have no thoughts. They have no memories. They're just kind of, you know, like greyhounds going after the mechanical rabbit. They have no lives. So we don't really believe that they exist. You know, if you look at some of these, you know, thriller heroes, you go, do they have a hobby? You know, do they have an old girlfriend? What do they think about? You know, did they have a trike? Um, they're not really people. They're just sort of locuses of activity. And I'm very interested in character oriented fiction. So I like those those uh, little memories and little acts of imagination uh, with a character because it it keeps them as real people. They make it makes them feel like real people. Here's a question. Excellent. So Nade has a question about Paint It Black, my uh, novel, and there's a, a special on it on ebook. If anybody takes ebooks, there is a special on. Uh, Paint it black in ebook for like two bucks, so it's a good deal. Uh, there's a scene where I describe my protagonist thinking about visiting friends during her. She's in mourning. No, then that's not a spoiler problem. Um, and she thinks they would drink hot wine with cinnamon sticks. Do you mean stolen or warm? Hot, oh, hot wine with cinnamon sticks. No, it, she's thinking about um, the art teachers. She's an art model, and she thinks of them as kind of staid. She's a real, she's a punk rocker. Um, and so she thinks, like, for them getting sh schwacked on hot wine with cinnamon sticks, that's like a big deal. So it means like a hot muddled wine for Christmas. Uh, and... There's, so she thinks, she imagines this, and there's also her spin, psychologically, that she thinks that's kind of something losers would do. Um, so uh, it has a smell, and it has a taste, and, and it has the senses. Very cool. All right, well, listen, I want to um, thank you for joining me for Writing Wednesday. And you can always send me questions through my website, uh, JanetFitchWrites.com. Use that that uh, email form, and I'll always see it. And uh, send me questions. I'm happy to make these about around some question that you have. Um, so well, here's another one. How do you, Krista? How do you approach dreams? Some people hate dreams and say never want to see a dream in a novel. Blah blah blah. I use the dream. Now, often a dream will begin a chapter. And then as the chapter proceeds, we understand kind of psychologically where the character's at, what they're working on, what worried them. Um, or we see a dream that it tells us something about their current situation in a veiled way, the way dreams do. It's a it's a, a coded description of what we know about them. Um, I've I love dream, you know. I, I'm a big Jungian dream anal analyst kind of person. I 
I find it very interesting and so and so metaphorical so that I don't mind doing dreams um, just not too much because nothing is more boring than listening to somebody else tell their dreams so you know keep it to a paragraph don't like make a chapter out of it not very interesting especially if we can understand like you know you have a character's pregnant and they have a dream about this a seven-year-old boy and then losing them on the street you know it's we understand the character's anxiety about motherhood a little better all right well write today absolutely and uh and we'll be back next week for writing wednesday oh and also on the 20 is it the 23rd i'll be doing fiction first aid again with uh the community of writers which are little uh, 15 minute uh, consults very fast very useful uh you bring a question or you can just bring a page of your work and and we'll look at it and and uh tell you about it so it's me and other like fabulous writers they have a, a, they have a deep bench uh at the community of writers so that'll be really fun all right have a good day and uh good writing